The second one occur, he calls the spirit of blasphemy. Let's hear how he describes that one. The spirit of blasphemy mingles intolerable blasphemies with all their ideas and thoughts. At times, these are so forcefully suggested to the imagination that it almost makes these souls pronounce them. This causes them grave torment. In other words, they don't like these temptations <laughs> because they're, they're wholly orientated to union with God, and these temptations make them think they're going backward or something is wrong, or, or they feel on the edge of, of giving in to them and feel that, the, that possibly their growing friendship of God will be compromised and so on. So that this, this pervasive anxiety is intensified in, in this period by, by such an experience. Um, I remember uh, uh, attending a, a Eucharistic service once when I was in high school where the priest may have been in this situation. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's a period in when, when one, uh, one experienced intense irascibility. And, and this dear man was offering the Eucharist, and, and his server, all dressed up with his red uh, cassock and stiff white collar, was supposed to ring the bell at the Sanctus, which is that point of the Eucharist that introduces the most sacred part of the celebration. Well, this, this little boy was a little absent-minded, and he was kind of wool-gathering. And so the priest turned, having said it once, and repeated it, Sanctus, 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 which means holy, holy, holy. And, and this completely discombobulated the little boy. He couldn't remember where he was or what he was supposed to do, and he just looked blank at the <laughs> father, and he began to feel more and more terror. And, and this, because this poor priest was in the night of sense, I suspect, his, his level of patience was, was very thin indeed. Maybe he has suffered a, a couple of these temptations of blasphemy that we've described here. And so he just lost it. And he turned to the little guy, and at the top of his voice, he shrieked, Sanctus! 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 <laughs> this poor little creature just disappeared into the... Everybody in church was just paralyzed with shock. What has happened to Father at this most sacred part of the mystery? And, and so everybody was just shaking. And we barely got through the surfaces, and then as soon as communion uh, was over, everybody just vanished in through the door. <laughs> So the, the, the intriguing thing about the night of sense is that sometimes God leaves you so weak and now you don't have strength for almost anything uh, in the way of virtue <laughs> that you fall on your face in public. Well, this is a marvelous way of reducing self-esteem <laughs> and, and emphasizing one's, uh, one's weakness. The same thing can happen uh, you know, to married couples who are in this journey. Uh, let us say the husband has, has had a hard day at work, his, his prayer, which he faithfully follows, is as dry as dust, so, that, so there's no sense of, of peace or reassurance being fed into his reservoir. If it's being fed, it's, it's not known to him. So, so he comes home, and he walks in the door, some, and his level of patience being almost uh, reduced to nothing, and his wife has burned the beefsteak or something else. He shouts, why, after a hard day's work, do I have to come home and have a dinner like this? Can't you do better than that? And, and, and he unloads on her all the anger and indignation that he really has towards God. But he's not quite holy enough yet to recognize that God is kind of putting him in this state. And so he's, he's not honest enough to, to, to recognize it's God who is doing this. And so he projects his anger on some innocent person, it's his wife. And so she dissolves in tears, and it's a tough evening for everybody, and so on. Hopefully, it's a great help if she's in the night of sense, too, she might understand this. 
<laughs> so then she can unload on him. Now, those of you who are thinking of getting married or who are married and are both on the spiritual journey, here's, 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 a, here's something to look forward to. You, you'll be able, when you each get in the night of sense, you'll be primed now to be able to, to not to take it to heart and just to lovingly to say, now calm down, dear, it's only God who's doing this to you and so on. And, and to, in other words, to help each other process this stuff. You've got to go through it. And I think this is, I suspect this is one of the great purposes of, of a truly happy marriage. That is, since you're ministering God to one another, when one or the other gets into this unloading process, the tension isn't just going to come up during centering prayer or periods of contemplation. The irritability, the, the lack of, cons uh, of consolation is going to make you f this person real edgy. So to be able to put up with that and lovingly accept it and to minister God's love, well, this is what marriage is all about, isn't it? It's the sacrament. It's supposed to manifest the love of God to each other all day long. The way you pour the cup of coffee, how you say good night, all of this is part of the conjugal relationship in which the divine love is being ministered by the couple all day long. Well, if you get each other to on the spiritual journey, then I'm sure that you could advance the cause of God by the patience, the love that you showed each other. Well, here uh, it also occurs in monastic life or in, in the spiritual journey such as uh, of a solitary character such as Anthony was engaged in. Uh, uh, again, since my own experience is the one I know best, let me share this tale of woe. Uh, when, <laughs> when I emerged from, from uh, the early years of my formation into the... Uh, professed house, the novices and professed usually were kept separate in those days, the, the, the professed used to dump little chores on you, you know. Uh, you were a sitting duck for such things. How can you say no to the older religious? Well, anyway, remember that I had this project to spend all my time in church that was free. So here I come rushing in from work and wash my hands quickly, rush into church. Uh, to be with the Lord, and, uh, and I was in this uh, dried out period, and, and, and this sacristan or somebody would give the sign, they'd come over here. There was a, 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 a diocesan priest had come suddenly, wanted to say a private mass, and it was my chore to set out the vestments. Well, here I was setting out the sacred vessels of the altar with the vestments and all, and inwardly this terrible anger was rising there goes my time again. Why can't they ask somebody else? Notice the commentary. It's always in heaven. And, and uh, why did this priest come here in the first place? <laughs> so why do they ask me? How can you get any time for prayer in this monastery? And so on and on and on. So instead of taking satisfaction in the honor of being able to set out the vestments for the sacred worship of God, I, I, I was hating it. And then, then the feelings of blasphemy would start rising. Because uh, by this time I had enough faith to know that, that God is arranging everything. So I would say, why the... Shh, why? <laughs> I can't just repeat it. Why do you do this to me? Here I'm trying to go in there to pray and you're fouling up all every chance I have. And, and here's what happens at this point. If you could get a hold of God, you'd like to choke him. And if you could throw him into the lake, you would do so. Imagine the amusement God must have from seeing this ultra-pious soul who's given three or four years to, to prayer and piety and lives in this ascetical mansion and so on, with these thoughts going through his mind. Uh, he must have a great laugh. He says to the angel, this guy wants to choke me to death. <laughs> but really, that's just how you feel. And there's nothing you can do because you, you can't swear at God, but something in you really wants to because he's put you in such a place that's just impossible. You, you're, and your patience is completely run out. So do you think these horrible thoughts, then of course you say, you have the guilt feelings. How could I have thought such a thing? How could I have wanted to have been so cruel? When God has done everything for me, I, I guess I should leave. Here's the demon coming. 
who says, are you sure you should? But this is no place for you. <laughs> you don't have the patience of this life. And so, so he reinforces those ideas. And so with us on the spiritual journey, especially if you, you've just ruined your evening and your wife's evening or vice versa because of you unloaded her, your indignation, which really was aimed at God, but you hadn't quite the courage to recognize it yet. And you fall on your face, uh, other, and, and you're just a mess and so on. Well, if you can just accept that sweetly and lovingly and say, ah, how, how sweet it is to be so miserable, how sweet it is to be weak and in order to depend completely on God, and to be like that little child in the mud puddle, don't let it bother you. You can be sure if you just hold out your little hands God and come and rescue you and tidy you up and try again. Now there's a third trial, oh God, that arises. But John of the Cross says that this is very much like the later trial, which he calls the Night of the Spirit, in which the, our inmost spirit is purified and purged of its last uh, selfishness or traces thereof. And let's hear about that one. This, in, this has a funny name. At still other times, another abominable spirit, which Isaiah calls the spirit of dizziness, is given to them. Not for their downfall, but to exercise them. <laughs> this spirit darkens their senses in such a way that it fills them with a thousand scruples and perplexities so intricate to their judgment that they can never satisfy themselves with anything or find support for their judgment in any advice or idea. This is the most tormenting of all, because now uh, when they're in such a perplexity, which could be vocational or some matter of conscience or some relationship or whether to break it keep, or keep it and so on, and they can't decide what to do. And they're like a ping pong ball going back across the net. Yes, I'll do this, and no, I better not. I better do something else. No, not that, but this. And even when they go for advice and someone says, no, you're fine, and, and here's the solution to your problem, and don't worry, that lasts about one minute. Then they're back in this whirlpool of, of uncertainty and, and scrupulosity, and they feel abandoned by God sometimes and rejected, and that maybe they've committed some terrible sin, and it's the end of their relationship with God. And, and so on and on it goes, and they can't do a thing about it except stew in their own juice. Well, now let's, let's look, take a look at, at the motive why God allows this kind of trial. Notice, please, what these extreme temptations point to. The first one, the spirit of fornication, these intense, prolonged, upsetting, distressing experiences for those who, who don't want to be involved at all, who have some other commitment. It's obviously the sensation center is being addressed. Now what happens in the night of sense is that all the senses begin to dry out and all the satisfactions that we had begin to dry out. And now nature in the raw, out of defense, begins to crave to feel something, anything, anything, even something awful. It would be nice just to, to, to drink uh, something you didn't like, to taste something you didn't the, the, the deep craving of, of human nature is, is natural, and it is to feel something with the senses. And the nature of the night is the senses are going to sleep, and, you can, and, and so you don't feel anything. And so all of a sudden, nature reacts with an explosion and reaches out to feel something, anything, and it grasps often on the sexual energy because it's it's, it's close at hand, and it's most, for most people the most pleasurable experiences. So it's natural that there should be an explosion of sexual ex feelings and temptation be as an expression of the craving to feel something. Everything is gradually, slowly being dried out, and, 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 and our nature, or the fault self system, is aware that it's, it's going to be 
going to die out if it doesn't do something. So as, as a kind of last resort or panic, it grabs on the first thing it can hang on to. It could also express itself in gluttony, overeating, love of chocolates. <laughs> I suppose it could express itself in drinking too, even if you weren't an alcoholic at this point. You, with you, you'd like to go on a few binges, but anyway, <laughs> anything but this dryness, that's, that's, that's the source of the temptation. Okay. Under the divine light, and the, what the divine light is doing is, is like a spotlight on a stage. It's putting its finger of light on the problem, which is the innate selfishness of each one of those programs, and it's gradually bringing them to an end. This is the process. We can't bring this false self system to an end. We can allow it to happen. It happens if you start doing the best you can to dismantle it, and then God moves in out of his great appreciation for your efforts and does the job, and then all we have to do is consent. And that's about the biggest job there is. Well, in, in the spirit of blasphemy, what, what energy center is involved? It's this one, the desire to control, which is being frustrated at every possible moment. And now it gets so angry at not being able to control anything. One at least wants to control one's own life. And now God makes that impossible too. So one, one, one reacts along the way we always did with our frustration when the energy center is denied with anger, and anger to the point of blasphemy, which wants to get revenge even with God, if that were possible. And, and there's some stories in the Bible that express that state marvelously and, and with great humor, such as the uh, book of Jonah. He was furious with God. But they didn't bother God. He continued to tell him to go and prophesy like I told you. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, it, it's one of the more remarkable uh, revelations of God's mercy that there is. Uh, to read that book sometime again in the spirit of what I'm now saying. And, and finally, the spirit of dizziness. What is that? Spotlighting. The desire for certitude, which is the security center. That is to say, the desire to know something for sure anything. And in this state, you don't know anything for sure. And, and so it's devastating to the desire, uh, to the ultimate resource where the security system emerges. Now, the spiritual journey is a call into the unknown. That's the nature of it. And the paradigm is the call of Abraham in faith, to leave the territory you know, the, the people you know, your friends and relatives, property, and come into a land that I will show you. You can't plan. You don't know where it is. I'll show it to you. Just follow. This is essential for us to move out of these childish relationships into full rational consciousness and beyond. Because where God is taking us, we haven't the remotest possibility of knowing. No eye has seen, it hasn't entered into the imagination, as Paul says, what God has prepared for those who love him. So the only way to get there is not to know where it is. And the desire to know is one of the final obstacles to entering full sail on the ocean of, con uh, of trust and confidence and into the divine union. So these trials are an immense favor that God is giving us. He, he doesn't deliberately do them. He allows them to happen, and, and, and we get into our own stew. But, but the night of sense is beamed with full light and force at dismantling the false self system, the energy centers fossilized from our emotional program for happiness. It goes right to the heart of the problem, which is selfishness and demolishes it because it just puts it all to rest. And after a while, you will get worn out fighting God <laughs> and your feelings and, and, it, and your efforts don't work. You finally accept the gift of God peacefully. And then you move into the contemplative experience of rest as an abiding state. And you're in a kind of plateau. Now, this is the place that Anthony arrived at as the result of his struggle 
with the temptations to leave the spiritual journey, positive and negative, and his, and his trial with the his battle with the spirit of fornication, which ended successfully only when, in addition to refusing to consent to these solicitations, he also refused to consent to the solicitation to vanity and self-aggrandizement as being a successful and virtuous person. That love of our own virtue is called the pride of innocence and is one of the worst forms of pride <laughs> that there is. It attributes to oneself what God alone has done for you. And this he doesn't like too well. He likes us to be honest and true. And, and so uh, <laughs> there's a f famous description of the nuns of Port Royal that expresses this well. They were described as pure as virgins or as angels, but proud as demons. <laughs> and, and this is the risk of this point in the spiritual journey when the experience of virtue, the experience of freedom from sin or the emergence of spiritual powers from the unconscious in the form of spiritual consolations or psychic powers goes to your head. The only guarantee that it won't, because it's a big... <laughs> tendency for it to go there is to learn the hard way, the existential way, one's own human misery apart from God and the depths of the selfishness of which we are capable, which the dark night graciously presents. It's humility that is not abstract but experienced that is the safeguard of, of the unloading of the ontological unconscious, which is the experience of spiritual strength and power, which is all God's work in us. And to take credit for that is a distortion of the spiritual journey and can lead to all kinds of damage to ourselves and to others. Hence, the crucial nature of attributing to God the higher power of whatever success we experience and attributing to ourselves our failings and faults and being honest about them and not too worried about them because we learn from experience. If you just get up, you've learned something new of great value and you can get, aw get on with the spiritual journey without any backward look or self-recrimination. Self-recriminations are always neurotic, always. Uh, they, it's pride saying, you've done it again, you dumb so-and-so. <laughs> you, you, you're always fouling things up and not measuring up to my proud standard of perfection, excellence, or whatever the baloney might be. Okay. So, so this experience of Anthony, then, is the paradigm of the night of the senses in which, once and for all, God puts to rest this false motivation in order to free what was truly good on each of these lower levels of human life uh, so that we can integrate them into our ongoing movement into full human responsibility for ourselves and our personal response to Christ and consenting to the higher stages of consciousness, faith and love to which he is constantly inviting us. Thank you.